Amen. All right. Mr. James, I'm going to give Mr. James a hand for heading up the strings group. Does a good job with that. They work hard on that all for, you know, for months at a time. So I appreciate that. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, go ahead and get your Bibles. Open it up to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to get this uh, music stand right here. I'm good, Mr. James. You got this one right here, brother. I, uh, so uh, today's message is called The Christmas Gift. The Christmas gift. So we're going to look at the Christmas gift that uh, is offered to us. And we're going to go to, like I said, Luke chapter 2. Let me catch up with you and get over there. All right. Amen. We've had a fun morning, haven't we? Luke 2, right after Luke 1. There we go. Found it. Okay, so... Um, so Christmas, when you think of Christmas, you think of, um, well, big part of Christmas and the reason we celebrate Christmas is because of what God did through Mary. Um, God formed Christ, God formed Christ and brought forth Christ, the natural man, through Mary. And God desires to form Christ and bring forth Christ, the spiritual man, through us. Paul talks about the principle that God uses. He says, first the natural, then the spiritual. God initiates, orchestrates the details, determines the time, and completes the formation of Christ, the natural man, through Mary. And we're going to see that in Luke chapter 2. We're going to see the initiating of God to do that, the orchestration of God to do that, the timing of God and the completion of God, and you'll see that none of this depends on man's desire or will. It has everything to do with man simply participating in what God wants to do, whether he is aware of it or not. And that is what happened to bring forth the natural man, Jesus and to bring forth the spiritual man, Jesus, in and through us, it is the exact same way. It is not the result of what what we desire or orchestrate or try to time or try to complete or even initiate. But it is God, as we do desire Him to do so, it is God as we trust Him to initiate, to determine the details and the orchestration of, to determine the timing of, and to complete the work that he's begun in us by bringing forth Christ, the spiritual man, in and through us to actually demonstrate Christ himself through a man or a woman. And in Luke chapter 2, we see the details of this. In verse 1, he says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, the governor of, uh, was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Caesar Augustus was a wicked man. I probably could assume that Quirinius, Quirinius was a wicked man. Herod, King Herod, was a wicked man. If you think, as Caesar thought, that it was his initial idea to have a census, you would be incorrect. Do not think for a second that God cannot work through wicked government to bring forth his glory. And in fact, oftentimes take wicked men and orchestrate things to, through them that brings forth Christ through the holy man. 
God will give ideas like, maybe we should have a census for the first time ever. Because I want to orchestrate the formation of Christ through a woman. And I will go to the means of having the king of the whole known world of the times, Caesar, and give him an idea that he should have a census. There's the initiation of Christ. God is initiating the formation of Christ the natural man through a woman named Mary, a no-name, pure-hearted, virgin woman who loved God and knew her need for God. And God says, I'm going to form Christ the natural man through this woman for many reasons, but one of those reasons Obviously for salvation and sanctification and glorification. But one of those reasons is to set the pattern for how I will form Christ, the spiritual man, through every man or woman who puts their hope in me. It's obvious that Mary didn't have a whole lot to do with bringing forth Christ. Other than believing the message of God that was given to her. And trusting the message of God that was given to us. Might I add that that is what we ought to do? How many men would have corrected the message that she heard from the angel that day? God is going to impregnate me and I'm not going to have a man help me in that whatsoever. No human effort whatsoever. But God is going to impregnate me and I believe him. How many churches would have corrected her? How many men would have corrected her? That's not the best way to bring forth Christ. You see, God's ways were higher than ours. And if his ways were higher than, than Mary's and everyone in her community, then in, in the formation of Christ, the natural man, it's the same that his ways are higher than ours in the formation of Christ, the spiritual man, in and through us. It will require, it will require no human effort. It will not require the brilliant wisdom of man to do so. For, oh, it is so limited. But watch. The initiation of the formation of Christ the natural man, God actually used wicked people to call a census. Nothing spiritual about a census. Nothing holy about a census. See, man would say, we've got to bring forth Christ. What spiritual thing can we do? God says, no, no, I'll work even through the natural things to bring forth my spiritual purposes. I will work through wicked men if I need to, to benefit the holiness and formation of Christ, the man, the Christ, the spiritual man, through my holy people. I will even work through the wicked. Verse 4. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. By the way. Bethlehem was prophesied, would be the place of the birth of the Messiah. Just know that because Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth. So God moves Joseph, who was pledged to be married, to Mary, who is the one God selected to bring forth Christ, the natural man, the Messiah. It's God. He's beginning to orchestrate the details. We saw the initiation through wicked men. Now we see the details being orchestrated. The prophecy was for Bethlehem. I got to get the man who's pledged to be with the woman who's impregnated by the Holy Spirit to birth the Messiah. I got to get them in Bethlehem. So here we go. Here goes Joseph. Makes a decision to... Take part in the census that a wicked man was given the idea from God to do. Oh, the details. The details. God's ways were way higher than us. And here he goes. God didn't have to come to him in a dream and say, I need you. I have to tell you what I'm up to. Because I need you to do everything perfect for me to bring forth. No, that's not what he did. He said, I'm going to get this man to the proper place. So the prophecy can be fulfilled. And this man doesn't even understand that. 
more than likely. Has no, it, 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 watch, he's, he's going to Bethlehem because he had belonged to the house and line of David. Verse 5, he went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. The details. Look at the next verse. While they were there, oh, coincidence. The time just so happened to be perfect, huh? The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, placed him in a manger, my mic went out, because there was no room for them in the inn. So, prophecy says the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. The Bible says prophets long to know the times and circumstances that God would bring forth this, the sufferings of Christ and the glory of Christ and, and, and the times now. And all these things. And look, all the details of bringing forth Christ through a woman. All the details of just so happens that at the right time, Wicked men decide to have a census. It just so happens at the right time, the circumstances are aligned just perfectly to where Mary just so happened to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit exactly nine months before the census would take place, which the census didn't even exist when she was impregnated because it was the first one ever. Just so happens that the guy pledged to be married to her is from Bethlehem. Just so happens that they go from Bethlehem all the way, I mean from Nazareth to all the way to Bethlehem. And while they're at the census, not a day later, not a day before, but while they're there, not on the way there, not on the way home, but while they're there, oh, the babies do. Oh, and by the way, prophecy was fulfilled. Wait, oh, wait, 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 wait. The will of God happened and no man knew what was going on. Amen. God did not rely on human understanding and God did not rely on human effort. Rather, humans in their understanding and in their effort ought to rely on God. You see, let me say it again because I've never written it down. I've never said it before. God was not relying on human effort or human wisdom, but man in his effort and wisdom ought to rely on God. Prophecy was fulfilled. The will of God was, was done. And not only was it done, but it was done at the right time. How many times have we tried to birth Christ into a dark world and forced it, and it was the wrong time? And we've pushed people from God, and we profaned something that could have been real holy had we waited and trusted, and the time had been right. You see, God knows how to initiate. He knows how to orchestrate the details. He knows when to do it. He knows the right time, and he knows how to complete that work to where even the pagan says, that was God. And if he did it with Christ the natural man, how much more will he do it with Christ, the spiritual man, in and through you. What is the mystery of God, O oh, Gentiles? It is Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. Amen. So Jaden sent me a, he sent a few of us a text one day about Emmanuel. Isaiah prophesied that he would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, guys, the greatest Christmas gift is that God is with us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is with us. Will we let God initiate, orchestrate the details, determine the times, and complete the work of forming Christ in us at any given time as he orchestrates these things, as we trust him to do so, but Christ himself, not like Christ, not we're going to be like him, but no, we're going to let him be exactly who he is in and through me. That's different. That's, that's different. That's different. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not through with the Christmas story. But, but I tell you, but I'm going to tell you, when we let Christ be formed in us, you'll never have the awareness that Christ is with us 
like that point in time. When, when you see Christ formed in and through you in a given situation, and you walk away and you say, oh, what did I just say? What did I just do? I'm not able to say that. I'm not able to do that, and I've never thought that. And you walk away fully convinced that, oh, Christ is with me. Your life will drastically change. You'll say, oh, I want that to happen again. And you'll be tempted. Oh, you'll be tempted. Oh, after Gideon, after Gideon had an army of 400 that defeated an army that was a ratio of 400 to 1. Every one man had to defeat 400 men. This happens and Gideon goes right back to worshiping idols. Because what happens is when you see Christ formed in you, you want it so bad, you're so tempted to go try to create it again. He said, that's so amazing. Let's go try to create it again. Mary gives birth to the Messiah. And then she goes to the wedding in Canaan and tries to tell him what to do. I want to see that glory. Yeah, I've seen it. Y'all got to see this. Y'all, I, I've experienced him. Y'all got to see it. Y'all got to experience him too. I've experienced, come on, Christian. I, what I've experienced, you all got to have this. Watch. Let me show you. And he says, he, says, he, he tells her whatever he tells her. I can't remember. And, 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 and she says, oh, oh, y'all just do whatever he says. And she walks back, and that was good on her part. See, many of us never humble ourselves the way Mary did right there. She humbled herself. She said, oh, that's right. I know my place. Do whatever he says. And, and look, how about this, Christian? Let him do whatever he wants to do in and through you. Let him initiate it, let him orchestrate it, let him determine the times, and let him bring it to completion. But let me tell you what happens when Christ is formed in and through you. Those in the community around you, without you trying, begin to see it. And they begin to be affected by it. There's a natural example right here. Christ is formed in a woman and brought forth through a woman. You see, it's one thing to have Christ in you, and it's another thing for Christ to be birthed through you to a dark world. That's what happened with Mary. Don't think in the natural, think spiritually. Come on, Nicodemus. Think spiritually about the womb, Nicodemus. T. Joe, I got to say it, but you called yourself, he was picking on the thing, he said, T. Joe Demas. But he's not T.J. Demas. He trusts Christ. But, but I, I, I thought about that, and I say, Jason Demas. <laughs> you know? You, you, and, and, you could, and you should do it, too. It, it's fun. And it reminds you that I need to think spiritually. Christ was birthed in a woman, but through her. If he doesn't come through her, it, it, it's doesn't really help a whole lot to have him in her if he doesn't come through her. Church of Galatia, Paul says, like a pregnant woman in pain of giving childbirth, that's the pain I feel until I see Christ formed in you or through you. Doesn't do a whole lot to have Christ in you if he doesn't come through you. So many Christians have settled to have Christ in them. I'm secure. I'm going to heaven. But that's selfish. That's a whole nother lifetime. That's a whole nother world. Even though the kingdom of God will be on planet Earth, planet Earth will be totally reshaped at that point. It'll be a whole nother planet that takes place on. A whole nother eternity, man. Look, don't, don't, ex please, let's not just experience Jesus in that life. Let him be birthed through us now because what happens is when, you'll see, when Jesus is born, others are affected. When Jesus is brought forth through us spiritually, others will be affected. Look at the shepherds. Verse 8, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. What are they concerned about? Their flocks. If you work at the mechanic shop, you're concerned about changing brakes. 
If you're an accountant, you're concerned about numbers. If you build fences, you're concerned about building fences. Chris builds fences if you need one built. They were concerned about their flock. They were going on about their lives. They didn't orchestrate anything. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord, not a imitation glory that man can produce, but the glory of the Lord that only he could bring forth. Again, not an imitation one that we bring forth and call it him. The glory of the Lord, not the glory like the Lord, his glory shone around them. Who initiated this? Shepherds were concerned about their flock. God initiates something. I think they probably loved God and probably sought him, probably desired to see his glory, probably were very holy shepherds. I, I think so. But I don't know. I know that God initiated something no matter who they were. And it says, they were terrified. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. God initiated a work. God is about to bring forth the awareness of Christ to an entire community. Now, these shepherds had no desire, and I'll show you in a minute, they had no desire to bring forth this message to the community. They did not initiate that idea. They did not try to orchestrate the details of this great outreach that they're about to experience. And they did not try to time it in according to their human wisdom, and they certainly didn't bring it to completion. These shepherds are about to have an outreach, a major outreach. They're about to be missionaries and have no idea no idea, and don't even necessarily desire it. Watch. Watch what they desire. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, verse 15, the shepherds said to one another, let's go, don't miss it. I don't know if you ever heard this in the Christmas message before. Don't miss this. This is what they said. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. You know what they said? Let's go experience Jesus. See, they're not focused on, let's go tell the world about Jesus. Wow. I want to tell the world about Jesus. But if I try to tell the world about Jesus, I'm going to miss experiencing Jesus. You understand? I don't know if I should say, they got kids in here. If... Mary had tried to orchestrate in her efforts. You with me, adults? Yep. That one would have been taken and God would have went to another one. It would have been taken. Flesh is taking it. I'll step back and I'll find an empty one. If the shepherds had been busy planning their next outreach... God would have said, I don't want y'all to be confused when I, if I get involved with that and I, and, I, and I do a great outreach for you, you're going to think it's you and you're going you're gonna to be unable to do that over and over again. No, 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 I'll take a step back. I'm going to find an empty shepherd. But he finds these shepherds, man, and all they want to do is experience Christ. You know, it's the one who says, I just want to experience Christ. He's the one that tends to 
experience Christ. And what I mean by Christ is, I'm not talking about salvation, the one that sees Christ formed in and through him, and Christ begins to initiate, determine the times and circumstances to reveal his glory, and he completes that work, and he begins to glorify himself in and through a man or a woman. That guy tends to find himself right in the middle of outreach. And he never planned it. It's like, um, if I came in here with a mohawk, I would find myself talking about my hair to a lot of people, whether I planned to or not. I knew that thing would come out at some point. I knew that mohawk would come out. But if I'm wearing Christ and not a mohawk, I will find myself right in the midst of talking about Christ. If if, if there are certain things that, when it's so ah, when it's so different from the norm, it gets talked about. If you wear a mohawk, you can talk about it. People are going to make sure you talk about it. If, 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 if you drive a, if you're a masculine guy and you wear pink pants, you're going to find yourself talking about your pink pants. It's just out of place. It's just different. No, no one does that. Oh. But if Christ himself forms his likeness and image through you, it's out, it's, it's out of place. It's rare. I'm telling you, it's rare, and you'll find yourself right in the middle talking about Christ because people bring him up. People wonder what's going on. You might even People might even think to themselves, how does this uneducated, unschooled, ordinary guy know what he knows about God? He's so confident about what he knows. I believe what he says because he's so confident. You see, because it's, 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 it's out of place. You don't see it often. We're seeing it a lot in your lives all of a sudden, though. I'm seeing it a lot. So these, these shepherds, they just, they say, they don't say let's go have an outreach. They say let's go see this thing for ourselves. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You, you would do more outreach if you just sought to experience Christ yourself. You would do more out- outreach than you can imagine. Okay, so... Um, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. See, that that, that was not their plan. Their plan was to see him for themselves. Once they saw him, they found themselves spreading the word about it. That wasn't the plan. It was the byproduct of truly experiencing the formation of Christ in and through them, Christ the spiritual man, they saw the Messiah. They experienced the Messiah. So, so that Holy Manual thing just, Christ is with us, but the awareness of that is not, sometimes it gets a little too distant. And I think because we're so passionate about seeing Christ formed in and through us, that sometimes maybe we've experienced this and we get our hands on it because we want to see it again. And I think the one who says, I'm just going to be a good servant and I'm going to do what Jesus said. He said the servant, when he comes back, the servant that is found doing the things he said to do, he'll be pleased with. And he said, but that servant, if you read carefully, that servant actually stands at the door and watches. 
He's not doing anything. He's watching. I'm watching for Christ to be eagerly desired. Nobody wants to do ministry more than me. Nobody wants to, wants to do a great work of God more than me. But I've learned that if that's going to happen in my life, it's going to be by me waiting and watching for Christ to orchestrate it and desiring it, not letting that desire ever go to sleep and praying for it and watching for it. And boy, Christ begins to initiate, it begins to orchestrate this thing. Whether it's on the offensive of, of forcefully advancing his kingdom or on the defensive of avoiding the this, this sin that grabs me. Either way, my desire for holiness must come about by me not letting that desire ever go to sleep and praying for it and watching for it, not me getting my hands on it. You see the difference? Mary didn't get her hands on it. And God's teaching us, don't, don't, don't get your hands on it. Get your desire on it. Get your hope on your expectation on it. And watch for Christ. Watch for him. And oh, when he does it, you already know you tied your hands behind your back, so you know it wasn't you. And boy, you say, oh, I've experienced him, and I love him. Oh, yeah. Now I love him. I really love what he did through me. I want him. Wait a second. I know him. Because he worked through me. I know him. I love him. I'm known by him. I'm not afraid of his judgment. I'm confident. That perfect love cast out all fear. The burden's not on me to initiate. It's not on me to orchestrate. It's not on me to know the right time. And it's not on me to, to finish. I can rest. Wait, I can rest in him. I'm enjoying my life all of a sudden. I'm enjoying my life. I have an abundant life. I know him. I'm known by him. I have a relationship with him. I'm not afraid. I'm confident. What a life. How many people are trying to get that life through other means? What a life. I like the scripture that Jaden read on Wednesday night. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 through 55, talk about being clothed. It says, I'm just going to paraphrase it. He says that the mortal, those who are mortal, us, are clothed with immortality. His life. Love, we'll just read it. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable, that's us. Now, now this scripture is talking about on the last day. It is the resurrection day. But go another level. Don't settle for that. Go deeper. Let the Lord remove a veil. Think spiritually, Jason Demas. Think spiritually. Think spiritually. Think about today. He, that which is perishable, my flesh, my body, my life, has been clothed with the imperishable. That's Christ is being formed in me. I'm clothed with him. The mortal, clothed with the immortality. He's saying, you who are flesh can be clothed with Christ. Then the saying is true. That death has been swallowed up in victory. You see, as we die to the temptation of flesh initiating, orchestrating, and completing the works of Christ, we die to it, say, oh, I want it so bad, but I can't do it, Lord. I need someone to do it for me. I'm dependent. I'm a child. That's when you're in that dead position, and the life of Christ says, oh, where, oh, death is your sting, here I come. He resurrects and he clothes those who are more mortal with immortality. That's, 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 that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the dead man to be clothed with the living man, Christ. Look at Ephesians 2.22. Let me just show you a couple of scriptures. 
of the benefit of this. This is such a special message that sounds so arrogant, I know. I'm not being arrogant. I'm telling you, what, it, what, what is being said through me is very special. This message is special, and we proclaim it week in and week out, and oftentimes take criticism for, such, for, for doing so, and have lost church members for doing so, and have gained others for doing so. This is a very special message that God is doing in our church. I, I, I'm telling you, I, it's, it's not, I, I am not orchestrating and planning these things. These things, this message is, has, has been given to me. It's been given to me. And I've been entrusted with it. it and it's, it, it's changing lives. It's taking the pressure of trying to look like Christ. It's taking that pressure of, I used to think I had to be godly. And now I realize that God is very godly. And if I let him be godly in and through me, then I'll look godly. I know it's kind of cheating, I know, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> We're letting someone do our homework for us. We're letting someone do all our work for us. Boy, is it pleasant. We're letting the one who was godly be godly through us. And it looks like we're, it looks like we're godly. We're letting the one who's very Christ-like. Jesus is very Christ-like. No one's more Christ-like than Christ himself. So what am I doing trying to be like him? And why don't I let him who is him be himself in and through me? That's what we're talking about. Ephesians 2.22. Look at this. And I want you to think. Watch. I'm going to show you something here. In him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Not a dwelling that begins to live like God. Not a dwelling that begins to, to, to try to attain to the life of God. No, 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 no. That's not what it said. It said you are becoming a dwelling that God Himself can live in. That's what Jesus said in John 14, 10. It's a, it's a football score. It's easy to remember, 14 to 10. John 14, 10, he says, Philip, Philip, he's, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, because the Father's living his life and he's doing his work through me. In other words, I, I, I'm a dwelling for the Father. He's abiding in me and I'm abiding in him and I'm letting him live through me. And this is what he's saying that, that we're becoming, oh, dwelling. Okay, this will be the first time you've ever heard a Christmas message that was convicting. Dwelling. I could think of two dwelling places that were offered to the little baby. One of them was the inn. It was called a lodging place. And it said no vacancy. We don't need that baby in here. All of our rooms are full. We don't have room. We're doing just fine. And then you had the humble little manger that says, I don't have any water to offer you. I don't have any food to offer you. I don't have power or electricity to offer you. I have nothing to give to Jesus. But I would love for you to reside here. Because for the first time, I will have living water and manna from heaven and the power that's far greater than any electricity man can produce. For the first time, this manger will be filled with Water 
food, and power. You see, it is the soul that says, I have a lot to produce for Christ that doesn't have any vacancy available for him. That has no vacancy sign. But it's the soul that says, I have nothing to offer you. I am poor in spirit. I might know a lot of scripture, but it means nothing unless you use it through me. I might have a lot of past experiences. We saw mighty works of God happen, but it means nothing, Lord, if you don't do it today. I might know a lot of theology. And by the way, I do. I do know, I know a lot of the Bible, man. Like, I know way more than I've ever studied to know. I shouldn't know what I know. And there were things in me that, that the temptation to, no, we got to teach that stuff. We got to teach, no, 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 no I, I, I'm, not, that's not, I'm not in charge of that. Because unless God uses it, it has no power. It's a form of godliness that denies the power of God. Unless God uses it in and through me, it has no power to do anything. It's a resounding gong. God who is love. Without love, we are a resounding gong. God is love. You can replace love with God and just say without God, it is a resounding gong. If I speak in the tongues of angels and I, and I, and I die in the flames for the cause, without God doing it in and through me, it is a resounding gong. It's just noise. An hour from now, you won't even be able to tell me what we spoke about if it's flesh speaking. But if Christ is having his way in and through me, and I believe he is, it'll stick. If, of course, you're receiving it by faith. That's the completion of it. Are we the end that calls itself a lodging place? That rejects Christ because we're doing just fine for him? Or... Or we a manger that has no water, no power, no food, nothing to offer the baby. But yet all of a sudden we desire him and he comes in and he brings power. All of a sudden people are worshiping, not at the inn, but they're worshiping the Messiah at the manger. Yeah. What man would have planned an outreach at the manger. Every man would have planned the outreach at the end. You see, God knows how to do it. He knows what's needed. If we let him reside in the manger, Ephesians 4, 22 will happen. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off yourself. Don't rely on self. Don't be the end, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. What is that mindset? It's to change my mind, repent, about relying on self and calling it Christ, to form Christ, the spiritual man, in and through me. It's to repent from that and to trust and rely on God. I like that word, Pastor Terrell, rely on him. To form Christ in and through me. That's the new attitude of mind. And to put on the new self. Watch, 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 watch this. When you were born again, you were created for this. Created to be like God in true, not imitation, in true righteousness and holiness. Talk about you were created to be a dwelling place. A little manger, humble manger that God dwells in and produces the right standing with God and the likeness and holiness of God in and through you. Not you trying to put it on. Him. You really wanting to put it on. And you knowing you can't do it. So you hoping for it, praying for it, and finally tying your hands behind your back and watching for it. You see, we say this a lot. Our job, our job is to do what John the Beloved did. 
he took his head, and while everybody was saying, I'm never going to deny him. No, you're going to deny him. I'm never going to deny him. John's just got his head on Jesus' chest. He's just saying, boy, if Jesus, I'm this close, I'm getting close to that old heart right there, and my ear's close to you, my head's close to you, and I'm not positioned to do anything. I'm just resting on you. I'm getting in position, Lord, to where if you want to speak something into me or do something in my life, I'm right in place. I'm at the starting line. I'm not going past the starting line until you do it, though. You see, we read our Bibles every day. This church, look, if you come to this church, read your Bible every day. Pray every day. I encourage you, take a little time and be still. Don't read or pray. Just be still before the Lord. Come every time that door opens to a general assembly. Come, be a part. You see, these are things that we can do to be close to the voice of God, where if he wants to speak into our lives, he wants to change something, we can be influenced by the holiness of Christ as we do what we can do to position ourselves close to him, but we can't make anything happen from that. That's the point. We're trying to do the things that we can do just to be close to Christ so that... Christ can do what only he can do in and through us. Only he can initiate, orchestrate, determine the time, and complete the formation of Christ, the spiritual man, in and through us. We know, uh, and, and I, told, I, told, I, I, I told some of the guys this. It's going to sound bad at first. If you want a shock wave, you go tell somebody this. You say, I no longer live for Jesus. I die for him. So that, Joe, so that he can live through me. See, if I'm trying to live for him, then there's no vacancy. It's full. The room is full. Full with my efforts. But if I'm dying for him, I'm emptying out. Now I'm the manger. So that he can be formed in me right there. You see it, Mike? That's what we're talking about, brother. We can expect that. I got another one. I wrote it down. We no longer have to try to be godly. We try to remain in trusting God so that God, who is godly, can fully live his life through us. And by the way, that's relationship. I want to be that manger. That manger was glorified way beyond the end. I've never driven by somebody's front yard at Christmas time. And I loved, I'm closing. Kim, come help me close this thing down. You're, you're, well, if she's still here, I need her. Uh, um, li listen, guys, I have never, ever driven by a house with Christmas lights, which I love to do. I love to go look at the Christmas lights. I've never driven by one and seen the inn and the yard. But hold on. It was doing just fine. Everybody wanted to be at the inn. It was full. It was the place to be. It had all the hype. But you know what? Many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. It seems like, a, seems like oftentimes what I see instead, and it makes me want to stop. It just, I just love it. I see the little manger scene. And I see the little baby Jesus. And we tell our kids, there's the baby Jesus. Declan was the baby Jesus when he was born. He was the baby Jesus in a little play. I think it was right here. The little baby Jesus. And yeah, he was cute. And, 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 and we, 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 see, we see the baby Jesus, and we, we don't see him in the end. But the end was doing just fine. It was strong and mighty and doing well. Everybody knew about the end. They probably had some local missionaries that tried to do a 
an outreach there at one point, I'm sure, or, or a pastor's conference there or something. No one even considered the manger, but yet the manger gets all the glory today. Why is that? Because the manger did not require any man to do anything, but it allowed God to reveal his glory in and through the manger. And now in 2021, we see mangers in front yards. We don't see inns in front yards. You see, for all eternity, the one who trusts God will be the one who was lifted high. They will be the one who was, who, 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 who was glorified greater than the one who gets all the glory today and tries to produce the works of God and gets the pats on the back. And, and the whole time, he's, there's no vacancy for Christ. It's the one who says, I have nothing to offer but I want you to be glorified in and through me. I want to be your dwelling place. I'm the end. I'm not the end. I'm the manger. I want to be your dwelling place, oh God. And if I'm your dwelling place, you will glorify yourself. And I'll find myself like the shepherds right in the middle of outreach all the time. Not all the time, but as he determines the time. But at times when I least expect it. I'll never forget, I had a woman knock on my door out of nowhere. And, and I mean, we know her, but we don't see her often. She knocks on my door. And she, I forgot why. So we don't know. Somehow it came up, and I just started talking about this message to her. She said, Pastor, she said, Have you thought about preaching that at your church? I'm like, You have no idea. That's all we preach. But who orchestrated that? She took a step back, and she's stunned. It's like I never heard that before. We're not taught and trained to be empty, trusting Christ to do his thing. We've been taught and trained to fill ourselves up with a bunch of godly looking things and call it Christ. That's the end. I want to be the manger that's empty. And says, I'm positioned. My head, John, like John, my head's against his heart. I'm drawing close to him. I'm seeking him. But... He's got to do it. He's got to glorify himself. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this message that it's just such a message of hope, God. It's a message of hope. It's a message that proclaims that, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're not depending on me. You want me to depend on you. And you want me to believe so much that you will fulfill the the commands on my life, the, the commission on my life, the call on my life, that you want me to believe that you will initiate those things and orchestrate and time them and complete them so much that I trust you that I'll be still and wait on you. That puts all the burden on Christ. The only burden we have is the trust that he will do it as we hope for him to. That's the hope of the Christmas story. The manger had nothing to offer Christ. When we become that way, Lord, we have nothing to offer you. But you do it, Lord, in and through me. Lifting me above because you're in me lifting me above the end. Drawing man to Christ in me when he be lifted up, not when I be lifted up. So Lord, we pray that you lift yourself up as we trust you. Lift yourself up, resurrect yourself in and through us that the world may glorify our Father in heaven. To God be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Merry Christmas.